Anyhow, so we're, we feel very happy that Dr. Alwell is out here um, opening the center and doing a nice big public appearance and uh, great to see the turnout. Um, I just wanted to uh, talk a little, one little bit about the center. So we're a full service ADHD center. So we do, it's kind of the modern treatment for ADHD. So we do uh, assessment and diagnosis. We do therapy. We do executive function coaching and we do medication management. Um, we'll, over time, we'll offer some other services like parent coaching and educational services, but that, those four services are really the core of what we've been doing. Um, I want to thank a few people. So in addition to Ned for coming out, uh, the, the Tadaro in Palo Alto Tadaro is Leslie Tadaro, who is, uh, runs very similar centers very successfully in Seattle, highly respected. Um, she's a therapist and has built a very uh, a big and very successful, well-respected um, a set of ADHD centers in the Seattle area. So thank you, Leslie, for also coming out, as well as some of our staff came from Seattle. Um, I also want to thank our partners at CHC. Uh, so you know, CHC has been serving the uh, children with mental health issues in Palo Alto for decades. They're really like, you know, probably the most respected game in town. They've been very generous to co-sponsor this event. Uh, we really like each other. We're finding ways um, to work together. So. Um, that's about all I want to say. I want to introduce my colleague uh, from uh, CHC, Dr. Ramsey Kasha. Thank you so much. Thank you. Wow, what a turnout. This is great. Did anybody take a canoe here tonight with all the rain out there? Uh, we're so glad that you're all here and you're all here safely. Uh, such a special evening. Uh, CHC is partnering with the Hollowell Todaro ADHD Center to bring you this fantastic presentation. Uh, we definitely want to thank the Bowman School uh, as well for graciously hosting uh, this beautiful new gym uh, so that we may present tonight. So hopefully many of you know that CHC has been partnering with the Palo Alto community for over 65 years. Uh, we are proud of our history here and for over those 65 years, uh, we've been delivering mental health and education services uh, for young people in our beloved community. Uh, we're so happy that we've been in Palo Alto for so long, uh, but we're especially proud that we've also been able to expand and deliver clinical services and educational services down in San Jose, uh, and also providing clinical services in our uh, neighbor, Ravenswood, uh, because we are committed to uh, equal access for mental health care. At CHC, we do believe in the promise and potential of every child. Uh, and our mission is really to remove the barriers to learning uh, and mental health so that we can help young people grow and thrive and be resilient and happy and successful in life. Uh, we thoughtfully and personally and very collaboratively uh, provide services to kids, teens, young adults, and their families. And we specialize in working with ADHD learning differences, anxiety and depression, and autism. Uh, CHC is particularly attuned uh, and adept at how mental health and learning challenges and attentional challenges can overlap 
And we know the special circumstances that our kids with these challenges are facing at home and in our schools and in the community. Uh, with regards to tonight's topic, ADHD, uh, we do provide evaluation services and medication management. We have support groups and we have two wonderful schools, Sand Hill School and Esther B. Clark School. Additionally, we provide fantastic community education, uh, just like this one through our Community Connections Division. And the hope is that we're able to foster connections between the one and five with learning and attentional challenges. So join us through many community connection events such as this throughout the year. We have parent and teacher education. We have parent support groups. We have outreach teams uh, for those of you who want to get more involved. We have our wonderful going on 10 years Education Revolution Expo, Ed Red Expo, which has moved to the fall, and so much more. If you want information for both CHC and the Hollowell Tadaro ADHD Center, we both have booths in the back. Uh, and we're so glad to have the center in our community. Uh, there is no shortage of young people who need all of our support uh, in this community. So we're glad that you're all here. Without further ado, I'd love to uh, introduce our guest speaker, uh, Dr. Ned Hollowell is a child and adolescent psychiatrist and a renowned ADHD expert who graduated uh, from Harvard College and Tulane Medical School. He's the founder of the Hollowell Centers and was a member of Harvard Medical School faculty for 11 years, retiring in 2004 to devote his full professional attention to clinical practice, speaking, and writing. Dr. Hollowell is a New York Times bestselling author and has authored 20 books. He's a highly recognized speaker worldwide. His books and presentations focus on various psychological and social topics and offer groundbreaking advice on ADHD, the power of the human connection, the childhood roots of happiness, forgiveness, worry, and managing excessive busyness. He's been featured on Oprah, Dr. Oz, Good Morning America, and interviewed for the New York Times, Newsweek, and Time Magazine. We are privileged tonight to have Dr. Hollowell here with us. I'm confident that we will all walk away with a new and inspired understanding of ADHD. Dr. Ned Hollowell. Thanks so much, Ramsey. Um, I want to congratulate you all on, on getting here. I mean, I don't think you could have ADD to find a parking spot and then find the auditorium. I felt completely lost. I thought I was in some sort of a maze. Uh, but thank you for coming out. And uh, also, John uh, forgot to invite you, and he asked me to remember to invite you, and I just remembered, so I'm very proud. Uh, to come to our opening party tomorrow uh, from 5 to 8 at the new center, which is 258, 298 San Antonio Road in Mountain View. Mountain View. Very good. All right. See, living with this condition is always a collaborative effort, so we've just demonstrated the uh, collaboration. The goal of independence is a very foolish goal. If any of you have that as a goal for your children, don't. Uh, the goal is to be effectively interdependent. No one in today's world is independent. We all depend on one another. So the, the goal is to learn how to ask for help and to have something you can give in return. The goal is to be effectively interdependent. And so many people are burdened with this notion of uh, you should be able to do it alone, which is a terrible idea. So let me just find out uh, uh, how many of you here have children who have ADHD? Okay. And how many of you here uh, have ADHD yourselves? Okay. And how many of you are married to someone who has it? 
And, and how many of you used to be married to someone who has it? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Just to put myself in those categories, I have both ADHD and dyslexia, uh, which I wouldn't trade for the world, and I'll, I'll explain to you why. And uh, I just turned 70 years old uh, last month. I don't look it, do I? <laughs> and, and, and so I've been living with those conditions for 70 years. I have three children who are now 30, 27, and 24. They all inherited my ADHD, not my dyslexia. My wife doesn't have it, but she wonders if it's contagious. <laughs> We've been married 31 years, and she is an amazing, amazing woman. I, I just can't tell you how much I depend on her. So what I'd like to do with you tonight is bring you into the world of this condition that is so misleadingly called Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. You'll hear me call it ADD and leave the H out, because when I learned about it, that's what it was called. And, and I just never really learned to say ADHD instead. It's unnecessarily confusing to a lot of people. Uh, technically speaking, there is no ADD anymore. It doesn't exist in the diagnostic manual. It's all ADHD, Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. If you don't have the symptom of hyper hyperactivity, you are called ADHD subtype primarily inattentive. Now, why they don't just call that ADD, I don't know. Uh, but they like to confuse people. So there is no ADD. That's ADHD primarily inattentive, and that's ADHD without the H. If you have both hyperactivity as well as symptoms of inattention, then it's called ADHD combined type. So now we've dispensed with that little bit of confusion. Both of those terms are completely inaccurate. And, and what I want to do with you tonight is, is bring you into the world of this condition uh, the way it ought to be, which is uh, uh, full of hope, enthusiasm, and success. I've renamed it, and John Rady and I have a new book that will come out at the end of uh, this year, where we, we, we've given it a, a new name that's a lot more accurate. We're calling it Variable attention stimulus trait, or vast, because it is vast in its expanse. A variable attention stimulus trait. Uh, there's not a deficit of attention at all in this condition. There's a, an abundance of attention. The challenge is to control it. If it were a deficit of attention, it would be a form of dementia, which it most certainly isn't. And then to call it a disorder uh, just overlooks the fact that, that many, if not most, of the creative, entrepreneurial, successful people in this country and around the world have the condition. And they've learned how to turn it into an asset. Uh, if you don't learn how to turn it into an asset, it can be a terrible curse. And that's what makes the condition so interesting. This can be an amazingly wonderful thing to have, and I'll tell you tonight how to, how to do that. But if you don't know about it, or you don't learn how to manage it, then it truly can be a horrible curse. The prisons are way overrepresented over with people who have undiagnosed, untreated, VAST, or ADHD. So are the holes of the addicted, and the unemployed, and the marginalized, and the depressed. Uh, so, so yes, it can be a terrible condition to have if you don't learn how to manage it. Russell Barkley, one of the great researchers in the field, did the statistics. And, and if you don't deal with it properly, this condition knocks about 15 years off your life. So it's up there with cigarette smoking if you don't learn how to deal with it properly. But if you do, then the sky's the limit. And people often uh, put Russ Barkley and me uh, as opposing one another. That's not true at all. We're two sides of the same coin. You know, the, Russ is Darth Vader and I'm Pollyanna, you know. And, and, and uh, you know, and, uh, 
Russ has spent a career proving how devastating this can be if you don't deal with it. And I've spent a career showing how wonderful it can be if you do deal with it. So it's two sides of the same coin, and Russ and I are friends, and I, I have the utmost respect for him. Um, so, so, so what, what is it, and, and how, how do you deal with it? What, what is this condition? Well, a good, a, good, a good way to think of it, just imagine the people who colonized this country. Think, think about who, just imagine you're living in England in 1600. And someone says, you want to get on a boat and go over to this, this new world? And, and who in, the, in their right mind would say yes? I mean, it pulled for a very special kind of person. And you look at those colonists at Jamestown and then, and then in the, the Puritans. They're ADD. They, that's who got into those boats. It was the dreamer, the entrepreneur, the risk taker. The person who couldn't sit still. It was the person who wanted to go for it. That's the American dream. Crazy, unrealistic, you know, way outside the box. You know, go, yeah, get on one of those boats, you'll likely die in the crossing, but who cares? You know, that, that's the ADD uh, mantra. Who cares? Let's go for it. Let's shoot for the moon. And, and that's our gene pool. And then the people who continued to come over in the waves of immigration, we've romanticized it, but we forget it was quite a feat to come to this country, don't speak the language, not a penny to your name. That's who is the ADHD population. The people who take chances, who have dreams, who come up with ideas out of nowhere, uh, don't know how they came up with the idea, where it came from, how they got it, but they have the idea. David Nealman, the man who started uh, JetBlue Airlines, dropped out of college because he just couldn't, couldn't do college. And he went on to become one of the great innovators in aviation. He thought up the electronic ticket. It just came to him. That's the way ADD happens. It just popped. And it was this great innovation. And I do think it's ironic that it's someone who has ADD who thinks of a way for us to go to the airport and not have to remember to bring our ticket. <laughs> you know. Uh, but th that, was, that was David's uh, brainchild, and, and he's also the guy who thought of putting uh, televisions in the back of the seats. So, you know, so these, these flights wouldn't be so, so boring, you know, and because and, uh, uh, in our world, in the a world of ADD, uh, boredom is kryptonite. We just can't do boredom. We just can't do boredom. And that's why these kids, you know, instigate something, because when they get bored, they've just got to make something happen. I was in a, in a lecture uh, at the Harvard Faculty Club, and I was in training, and I was supposed to be a good little doobie, and they had a speaker come in, and uh, the talk he was giving was so boring, I was sitting next to a window, and I jumped out the window. <laughs> Fortunately, it was on the first floor, so, you know, I, I, but I didn't care. I, I had to get out of there. I mean, for us, boredom is, in, is an emergency. We have to relieve the boredom. Other people can put up with it. We can't. And as much as boredom is our kryptonite, stimulation is, oh, we go, we're always looking for stimulus. That's, you know, that's why I call it variable attention stimulus trait. We're always looking for something stimulating. And if, it's, if it, 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 there are adaptive ways of finding stimulation, start a business, start a project, a creative outlet, physical exercise, a competition, and then there are maladaptive ways, and right at the top of the list is substance use. And the fact of the matter is, we, we are 10 times more likely to develop an addiction than the, than the general population. And, and it's, it's a real concern. And 80% of addiction starts between the ages of 13 and 23. So it's tremendously important to take very seriously this risk. By the way, contrary to popular belief, one of the best ways of preventing addiction in the ADD population is to be on stimulant medication. Far from being a, far from being a gateway drug, stimulant medication closes the gateway. And the kids who are started on stimulant medication have a dramatically lower rate of addiction 
than those who don't take it. Stimulant medication has been given a terrible press. Um, the fact of the matter is used properly, stimulant medication is a godsend. Certainly not the only tool in the toolbox, but it's a very powerful tool. So, so here you have this condition that is really uh, at the heart of the American grain. And what is it like to have it? The, the analogy I developed years ago that I use most often, it's like you've got a Ferrari engine for a brain. You've got a Ferrari engine for a brain. You've got this way powerful brain. But you have bicycle brakes. So you can't control the power of your brain. You can't channel it, organize it, direct it. You, you can't uh, uh, follow through on what you're wanting to achieve. And, and that's OK, because I'm a brake specialist. You know, and, and uh, those of us who work in this field, we're brake specialists. If you go to the new center, and by the way, I've been dreaming of opening a center in Palo Alto forever, because Palo Alto has got to be one of the ADD centers of the universe. <laughs> you know, and, 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 and I'm thrilled that thanks to Leslie Todaro and her team, we're, we're opening this. But, um, but once you learn to strengthen those brakes, then the sky's the limit. We have Nobel Prize winners who have this condition, CEOs, self-made not only millionaires, billionaires, people who, who couldn't do school, but boy, oh boy, did they thrive when they got out and were able to just let their brains uh, lead them where they would lead them. Another analogy I use is with Niagara Falls. It's just a lot of noise and mist until you build a hydroelectric plant. So ADD is like a lot of noise and mist and power until you build a hydroelectric plant. And then you can light up the state of New York. So I'm not only a brake specialist, but I'm in the hydroelectric plant business. You know, helping folks with this condition find ways of, of plugging into life so that their brain lights up and they can be productive. Uh, they, they can achieve, you know, what, uh, what they've wanted to achieve. The, uh, the, the idea that you, you, know, you have all this power uh, is wonderful, but it needs control. And, and for most of human history, this condition, by the way, people say it's some new thing. It's not new at all. This condition, this trait has been around as long as there have been people. You know, it, 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 the, the, the term is new, but you can read descriptions of people who, who fit this 500 years ago. It's just that in, until recently, it was viewed through the lens of morality. It was a moral diagnosis, and your diagnosis is you were bad. You were bad, lazy, willful. And the treatment plan was try harder. And to get you to try harder, we would punish you in various ways, shame you, spank you, uh, humiliate you. Uh, it, it, but so it was, it was a moral diagnosis lack of effort, laziness, with, with a moral, quote unquote, intervention, punishment, shame, and humiliation. And that sums up the treatment for thousands of years. It, it's really terrible, and it still hovers over. You'll still hear people saying, if only you would try harder, if only you could have more discipline. Well, duh, you know, but it, it's not on purpose that we don't have that. Telling someone with this condition to try harder is no more helpful than telling someone who's nearsighted to squint harder. It misses the fundamental issue. Let me read to you an email, and I get this all the time, but I got it today on the plane. I took a plane out of New York this morning, and uh, this is completely representative of the kind of email I get. Just to give you a sense of, of what it's like not to have learned about this. Dear Dr. Hallowell, I learned of your work just two days ago as I was listening to a podcast. I'm now a third of the way through listening to Driven to Distraction, one of my books, on Audible, and I simply had to reach out to you. I have been moved to tears listening to the histories of the sample cases you lay out. 
My heart is breaking for childhood me, who spent my entire childhood labeled extremely bright but very lazy. My elementary school work is full of unfinished work, and I frequently had to miss recess to finish work that I was too slow working on in class. This was due to a combo of distraction and debilitating perfectionism. On a side note, I am a little compulsive. I eat everything in pairs, right side, then left side. That's not uncommon. I cruised through school and all through college barely studying for exams and getting B plus A minus average. Imagine how well I could do if only I'd known about what was going on. My high school shop teacher begged my parents to convince me to finish my final project because it was brilliant, but I would fail if I didn't turn it in. In the wee hours before the final deadline, before the final extended deadline, I got it done in a flash. In college, I frequently pulled all-nighters because I just could not make myself stay focused and do the work. I made a sign and stuck it on the wall above my desk saying, knock it out and go to bed. As you can see from my signature, I am an attorney. Law school and the bar exam almost killed me. I would read the same page of a case over and over and over again, and it just would not sink in. Learning concepts in, in the abstract was extremely difficult. Five years ago, I had my first child. Two years ago, I had my second, and was just plunged into postpartum depression and anxiety. My son was extremely difficult and punished me for having my little girl. Being a perfectionist, I obsessed over parenting, but also lost my temper and screamed at him more than he ever deserved. I found a wonderful therapist who helped me through the postpartum. It was she who suggested I sound like I may well have ADHD. Now, as I listen to your book, I'm convinced that both my son and I have ADHD. I love your term, vast. I'm now looking into getting us both assessed. My son is about to start kindergarten in the fall. He's extremely bright, but simply cannot stop moving, has low frustration tolerance, is ragey, as am I, and has nighttime walking tantrums, nighttime waking tantrums, weekly now, but as a toddler, he would tantrum for up to an hour every time he woke up from any sleep. He also hyper-focuses on what he is doing and will not hear you unless you tap his shoulder. His hearing is fine. I have learned to tap tap him for attention rather than get mad that he's not listening. I hesitate having him assessed because I fear sending him to school with a label that could color teachers' opinions of him. He gets very sad when he gets in trouble, and I just don't want to set him up, and I want to set him up for the best possible outcome. I apologize for sending you this long and pointless story. I just thought you might like to know that your work has impacted yet another person. And it's so typical of ADHD that at the end she calls her story long and pointless. And I wrote back to her and I said, it's anything but long and pointless. You know, I said, thank you so much. In fact, can I read your email at a talk I'm going to give tonight? And she immediately emailed back and here I am up in the 30,000 feet, you know, and, and she said, of course you can use it. If it'll help anyone, uh, feel free to share it. That's also typical of ADD people. We tend to be very generous, very giving, very, uh, uh, very open. And, but you can see in her testimony there, in her account, what a struggle it was. You know, she was very smart, and that's typical. Uh, the popular misconception that th this means that people aren't smart is completely wrong. But she was struggling, and she, she was just getting by on effort. And, and, and putting up with being told she was lazy and being kept in from recess and all that assault on her self-esteem, but she didn't give up, and that's also typical of this condition. We don't give up. We don't give up. We keep bouncing back, and there she goes. She gets through law school, and she has two children, and she battles with depression, and then finally, someone, someone, and it, believe me, the biggest undiagnosed group are adult women, Someone says, you know, you might have this thing called ADHD. And I, and I can promise you, her life is now going to change dramatically for the better. This is a really good news diagnosis. Once you get the diagnosis, things can only get better. Things can only get better. The, the hard time is when you don't have the diagnosis. 
when you're being told you're lazy, when you're being told you should get your act together, when you're being told, you know, you're, you have so much potential, why don't you make good on it? And these, these moral lectures that are just so demoralizing, and you're thinking, I'm doing all I can do. What more do I have to do? And, and, then, and then someone, in her case a therapist uh, down in her, her hometown, said, sounds like you fit this. And she started listening to a description from my book, and you know, I, I, and I hear this story all the time. And that's why I'm so excited to bring you all uh, this good news, because it's really good news once you get the diagnosis. All kinds of things fall into place. You know, the, and it's a, it's a syndrome of contradictions. The most obvious one is this notion of, of, of attention deficit. The fact of the matter is we can hyper-focus. When we're interested, we can focus better than anyone. When we're not interested, remember kryptonite, is, uh, boredom is kryptonite, our minds go elsewhere. They don't go empty, they go elsewhere. The ADD mind is like a toddler on a picnic. It's just going wherever curiosity leads it with no regard for danger or authority. So you're just going off wherever, looking for something interesting, always looking for something interesting. Those of you in the audience who are bored listening to me, your, your mind is somewhere else. You know, and it's probably, I hope it's very interesting wherever you are. You know, and, 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 you know, and that's what we do. We just, we've got to have stimulation. We've got to have interest. I, I was talking to Leslie's sister-in-law, who's an ER physician. ER physicians, so many of them have this condition. Wherever you find conditions of high stim, you'll find a lot of people with this trait. Uh, trial attorneys, ER docs, traders on the commodities exchange, um, anything, entrepreneurs, you know, who are always on the edge, always pushing the envelope. We, we focus in moments of high intensity. By the way, that's why we have this habit of procrastination. But we, in our world, there are, t time is fundamentally different. In our world, there are only two times. There's now and not now. <laughs> so you say, we're having a, a, the book report is due next Wednesday. Not now. <laughs> and it's just gone, you know, and, and, and the, the good little doobies are sitting there writing down their study schedule between now and next Wednesday. The ADD folks, it's gone. <laughs> Until not now is almost now, as it was for her with her shop project. Then in a panic at the last minute, <coughs> you get it done. What happens in a panic? You get a big bolus of adrenaline. Well, adrenaline is chemically very similar to the stimulant medications we use to treat ADD. So basically, you're self-medicating with crisis. <laughs> you set up crisis to get you focused. You don't do it on purpose, but you learn over time that you, get, you do a lot better when there's a crisis. And by the way, that's why these folks are so prone to arguing. It's more engaging to argue about why doing your math homework is a waste of time <laughs> than it is to do your math homework. And then even better if you can get mom and dad fighting with each other about it. <laughs> you know, it's like going to the movies, you know? And, 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 and so the, the homework is long forgotten and take center stage is the struggle. And, and it's, it's in the search of stimulation, you know, see? And, and um, uh, so, so, but we we are, we as I say, we have these we have these contradictions. We have, you know, hyper focus and then going elsewhere. We we are unbelievably tenacious. We never give up uh, to the point of being stubborn and strong-willed. And yet, on the other hand, we're so generous and soft-hearted and big-hearted. You know, it, it, you know, you, 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 there's no consistency to this condition. It is consistently inconsistent. You're not the same moment to moment. Uh, you're, you're, you're labile. You can fly into a rage and then you're consoling your sister, you know, when she's feeling bad. I mean, it, it's, 
it's 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 just it's what makes it so interesting and, and you know and and so the, the the trick is to take advantage of the upside and not be penalized by the downside now at the heart of that is maybe what to me is the most interesting contradiction if you will or paradox of them all we have an extraordinary imagination the ADD mind is, is we, we are blessed with a very fertile imagination. That's why we're so inventive. Edison was a classic. That's why we're so creative. That's why we're so uh, uh, in, ingenious. And, and uh, Benjamin Franklin was another classic. Um, the imagination that we've got is, is amazing. But, and this is a new finding out of neuroscience, when your imagination is engaged in a task, when you're doing something, baking a cake, solving a puzzle, whatever it might happen to be, areas of your brain light up, and we can see it on fMRI. In aggregate, that's called the task positive network, the TPN. When you finish that task, the brain does not go silent. Another network lights up called the default mode network, the DMN, which I call the demon, and you'll see why. In the default mode network, when, you're, when it's not engaged, when you're not doing a task, the default mode network is the seat of the imagination, but it does a very dark and, and, and nasty thing. When you're not doing something, the DMN, the demon, starts feeding these horrible negative thoughts. You're bad, you're terrible, nothing will work out, no one likes you, you're ugly, you're stupid, you're fat, you're, you're a loser, you, you're never gonna win, nothing. And it just, this cascade of negative, brooding, ruminative thought just pumps out and you're sitting there in a chair by yourself staring into the future. You feed the demon with your attention. Why do you do that? Because it's riveting. Because it's stimulating. You don't say she was riveted in contentment. But you do say she was riveted in fear, self-hatred, despair, misery, anxiety. And you feed it because it is riveting. Remember what I said, we're always looking for stimulation. Well, very few things are more stimulating than angst. And that's what feeding the demon gives you. Horrible, painful, but stimulating. So the trick is, and that's why so many of us with ADD, we're hyper-creative and we are brooders, ruminators, uh, depressive, uh, passive, you know, hard on ourselves, incredibly hard on ourselves, selling ourselves short, imagining the worst all the time. You gotta learn how to not feed the demon. It's so difficult. You'd think it'd be snap your fingers. No, you have to learn how to do something else. When you're feeding the demon, you gotta stop. No, I'm not gonna do that. And just get up, walk around, kick a can, turn on the radio, bake a cake, do anything. It just has to be engaging enough that it'll activate the TPN again, that it'll <clears throat> shut off the DMN, because they can't both coexist. That, that you'll, you, so you have to get into something. If there's nothing around, make up a complicated breathing pattern and focus on that. Uh, you know, so, so you, so you, but don't feed the demon. Remember that mantra. Don't feed, medication won't touch it. Don't feed the demon. And those of you who identify with what I said about this, this terrible beast rising up and, oh, you know, I could, so many famous people that uh, are subject to this in, and they feed the demon and they mistake it for reality. They say, yeah, I really am a loser and I really am, you know, because I didn't win the Nobel Prize, I'm a tub of poop, you know, and, and, and they just lambaste themselves feeding the demon. It's not reality. Don't feed the demon. And the corollary to that, by far the best treatment for anxiety ever invented, never worry alone. 
It's natural to worry. Just don't worry alone. When you worry alone, you catastrophize, you globalize, you just imagine terrible things that are never going to happen. When you worry with someone, you quickly move into problem solving or laughter. You, you can stick your head into someone's office and say, life sucks. And the other person can say, yeah, life sucks. And you both feel better. <laughs> you know, th there's something about connection, the, the connecting with another person that is absolutely transformative. So, so again, that's another one of these contradictions. The imagination can, be, can win us Nobel Prizes, and the imagination can absolutely turn us into just paralyzing st states of self-hatred, pessimism, fear, and, and gloom. You see how complicated this condition is? Do you see how much more interesting it is than the caricatures that most people carry around with them? Um, th these people who have this condition are the most creative people in our society, the most entrepreneurial. Most entrepreneurs have this. Someone tells me they're an entrepreneur, I immediately start asking questions and, and most of the time, sure enough, they have it. They, they are often so successful that they never even considered it because they're doing so well, but they could do even better. One of my patients in New York is a self-made billionaire and he said to me one day, think how much more I could have done had I had this diagnosis sooner. I said, you haven't done too badly, but you know. <laughs> but at the same time, your absolute level of achievement is not what matters. It's what does it cost to get there? And you know, at, at, at what price are you paying? And once you get this diagnosis, you'll pay a much lower price to get much farther with, with more joy in your heart and less, less frustration. It's, it's uh, not dealt with properly because people are wedded to this deficit disorder model. The first thing I say to kids when I diagnose them, I say, you're so lucky. You're so lucky. You've got a Ferrari brain, but you have bicycle brakes. And the kid understands that. And he says, yeah, I've got to work on my brakes. And it also gives you a way of intervening that is not shaming. You know, you can, you, when you mispay, when you do something you shouldn't do, you can say, your brakes failed you. Instead of you're a bad boy or a bad girl, your brakes failed you. That's not shaming. Okay, I've got to work on my brakes. And the same thing in the adult world. Instead of saying you're a horrible person, you say your brakes are failing you. Let's work on your brakes. So it turns it into something you can work on, you can develop. And as you strengthen those brakes, then you can start to build your hydroelectric plant. You can start to start your business. You can reclaim your marriage. And, and believe me, th this, this diagnosis saves marriages all the time. People can be on the very brink of splitting up because they haven't had the diagnosis made. And the biggest undiagnosed group are adults. So it saves marriages, saves businesses, uh, saves school careers saves, as that wonderful woman who wrote me today, saves the sense of who you are, and instead gives you realistic hope, realistic ways of, of building, um, uh, building a life that, that allows you to fulfill your potential. So what is the treatment? Well, the treatment begins, as John said, with understanding the condition understanding how variegated it is, understanding the, that, that there, are, there are amazing talents in there. You know, I don't treat disabilities, I help people unwrap their gifts. And if you go to our center, that's what you'll get. A whole approach of how do we unwrap the gifts, how do we identify the talents. Now, in order to do that, you have to correct some problems to be sure. There are major problems that go with this. Um, but, but they're deal-withable, you see, they're deal-withable. And what we've got going for us, you can't buy and you can't teach. You can't buy or teach creativity, intuition, ingenuity, stick-to-itiveness, big-heartedness, uh, special sauce, zany sense of humor. You can't charisma, you can't buy or teach that. And the downside, we can work on. We can, we can, we can help you learn how uh, uh, to build your hydroelectric plant or, or, or strengthen 
strengthen your brakes. But it begins with getting you on board, saying, you know, this, you're, you're, we're going to work together to become a champion. Not to become normal. People with ADD are not normal. We're abnormal. But, but we're abnormal in a wonderful way. It's the abnormal that has built this country. You know, and, and that's why we, we lead the world in entrepreneurialism and ingenuity. That's probably also why we're so violent and, and uh, you know, some of the problems that we've got. But um, um, so it begins with identifying it, naming it, framing it in a positive way. And then take stock. What are your problem areas? And, uh, you know, depending upon what level you're at. Uh, work with a coach to help you learn strategies. Uh, make sure you have the right job, you're in the right school. Make sure you're in a relationship that makes sense. People with ADD have a terrible tendency to fall for train wrecks. They, 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 they fall for just, you know, because that's stimulating, you see. And, and, and it's, it's just, there's not a good future to it. So you, you want to try to find a, a relationship where it's stimulating without being a train wreck. So, and, then, and, then, and, then, and then make sure that your lifestyle is, you know, eat right, sleep right, meditate, um, um, uh, exercise, uh, uh, and then positive human contact. I call it vitamin C, vitamin connect. So powerful. So powerful. We are living in an epidemic of disconnection, which is ironic because we're electronically more connected than ever in human history. But people are feeling disconnected. And that's just not good. Vitamin C, connection, is what powers pretty much everything that's good and right and wonderful about life. And disconnection does just the opposite. It's why we're seeing a spike in suicide, anxiety, substance use, depression. You name the bad thing, it's on the rise because of the school shootings it's this phenomenon of disconnection. You know, so you want to always make sure uh, that, that whoever you're working with has a richly connected life. I prescribe dogs. <laughs> I prescribe dogs. It, it often gets parents upset with me, but everybody should have a dog if, if, you, if you possibly can. Dogs are the master of connection. It's no accident that, that God spelled backwards is dog, you know? <laughs> so, so you, you want to you wanna get as much of that as you possibly can. And, and, then, and then there are uh, medications that can work wonders. Medication works like eyeglasses. Medication, uh, when it works, works like eyeglasses. It doesn't, it, it, it doesn't fix it any more than eyeglasses fix nearsightedness, but it's a very good symptomatic treatment. Medication works about 80% of the time. By work, I mean you get target symptom improvement with no side effects other than appetite suppression without unwanted weight loss. You almost always get appetite suppression. So, so uh, but when, when the meds work, that increase in focus can be as life-changing as eyeglasses. Makes a big difference if you can actually see what's on the blackboard or see what's going on in the meeting, you know, or see what the, what's in the machine that you're operating on. Um, medication is, is controversial and it shouldn't be. It's uh, grossly distorted in the press. All the press talks about are the dangers and yes, there are dangers. If you snort it, if you uh, um, inject it, it's, it's bad for you. If you see a doctor who doesn't know what he's doing or she's doing, uh, you can get on regimens that are dangerous. So I'm, I'm not saying that it's not without danger, but given responsible parameters of use, it's really wonderful. And most people are really afraid of it because they've been given a lot of terrible information. Um, never forget the little boy in my office with his parents 10 years old and we were talking about starting him on Ritalin and he started to cry. And I said, well, what's the matter? And he said, my friend told me that it makes your penis fall off. <laughs> I mean, there is unbelievable wrong information out there and, and you know, and, 
and you know kids, they believe all kinds of stuff, you know, and, and uh, so, so before you write medication off your list, get the facts. Just get the facts. Talk to someone who knows what they're doing. Now there's a new treatment that I've become really excited about that takes advantage of some new brain research involving the cerebellum. The cerebellum is a, is a part of the brain at the back and underneath. Cerebellum literally means little brain. And it only occupies 10% of brain volume, but it has 70% of the neurons in your brain are in that cerebellum. And it turns out, thanks to the work of Jeremy Schmaman at Mass General Hospital, he showed that there are, when I was in medical school, we were taught that the cerebellum just governed balance and coordination. We now know, thanks to Schmalman's work, that the cerebellum is richly connected to the frontal lobes where the action is in ADHD, dyslexia, dyspraxia, dystonia, and emotional control. And it turns out, if you do exercises that stimulate the cerebellum, physical exercises, 10 minutes twice a day for three to six months, you get major improvement in these symptoms. Now, you have to do the exercises. But there are exercises that challenge balance. So standing on one leg, uh, standing on one leg with your eyes closed, standing on a wobble board, sitting on an exercise ball with your feet off the floor. So, and it's also very good for your core, by the way. So you, you, you do these exercises 10 minutes twice a day. You have to do them. You have to be faithful about it. But if you do them, uh, this fellow Winford Dorr, who developed it over in England, has about a 90% success rate, and he's given it to 50,000 people over in, over in Britain. Uh, he's an amazing man, and um, uh, I've become very excited about this, because this gets that underlying, this, whereas meds don't rewire, they, they act like eyeglasses, this is rewiring. This is learning new skills. This is learning how to ride a bike. And once you've done it, you've done it. You don't have to keep doing it forever. Uh, once you've done it, you've done it. And, um, you know, it's, uh, if you want to learn more, I'll give you a website you can go to. It's called uh, distraction.zingperformance, Z-I-N-G performance.com, distraction.zingperformance.com. Uh, it's, to me, the most exciting breakthrough I've seen in my 40 years of, of working in this field. And, uh, um, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm really excited about it. Well. Uh, I think my time, uh, what time is it? What time is it? Oh, thank you. Um, uh, I could go on, as you can imagine. Uh, but, uh, but, but you want me to talk a little bit more? Okay. Uh, but I, but I, but I want to have time for questions. Um, in, addition to, in addition to the interventions I, I've mentioned, um, Probably the most important thing is to sustain a relationship with whoever you're seeing for treatment. Because we get discouraged easily. And parents get discouraged easily. And as I said, the condition is inconsistent. So like if you come to our center, uh, Leslie will see to it that you don't get forgotten. You don't get lost in the shuffle. And, and we're in it for the long haul. This condition doesn't go away. I'm still learning how to manage my ADD, you know, and I, I'm getting old. Um, but but it, I have to keep working at it. And I have to keep generating hope. And I have to keep resisting the demon. You know, and I, and I have to keep, you know, sort of flossing my brain, if you will. Uh, because cause we can fall into fall into bad habits, the worst of which is just this negative thinking. And the other thing, for those of you who have kids, the thing to really watch out for is, is substance use. Um, addiction, more than any other pothole in life, can absolutely, absolutely just, just be tragic. And uh, so, so and don't think that marijuana is not a gateway drug. It certainly is for people who have this condition. You start smoking weed, and the next thing you know, that's all you want to do. And you get this amotivational syndrome. And then maybe you start with vaping, then you go to weed, then you go to Xanax. 
then you go to cocaine, then you're on opiates, and you've got a tragic situation on your hands. So really be very vigilant about that. Um, uh, as I said, stimulant medication is, is one really good way to uh, help reduce the risk. Education, another really good way. Uh, being attentive to the peer group, another good way. Um, not lecturing, not lecturing, but having folks realize that um, we simply have this need to alter life. Ordinary life doesn't do it for us. Remember stimulation? Ordinary life doesn't do it for us. We need to take it up a notch uh, to make it come alive, to make it be vibrant, to get us interested. Well, there are adaptive ways of doing that, having a creative outlet, starting a business, physical exercise, close relationships, solving a problem. Those are adaptive ways of juicing it up. And maladaptive, right at the top of the list, is, is substance use. Um, uh, so, so you can't make, I call it the itch at the core of ADD, you can't make the itch go away. We, we crave, you know, juicing life up. Just be careful how you scratch that itch. Be careful what you do and try to find adaptive ways of doing it as opposed to the maladaptive ways. Oh, I am going to stop and take questions, but I, I want you to leave tonight really loaded for bear, excited about having this if you happen to have it, or if you know someone who has it. You deal with this properly, it's a tremendous competitive edge, it's a tremendous advantage. It's a way of just loving life, and, and, uh, but it needs management, it really needs management. It, it doesn't take care of itself. Um, and, uh, 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 you know, and, and I'm so glad to be opening this center. Now, I'm not doing it, Leslie and John are doing it, but to be offering to this community a center where you can get a strength-based approach, which is what we take. Not a disorder, but a trait. And if you manage it right, you're a total winner, you're a champion. And not only in terms of success, in terms of big-heartedness and, and just vibrancy and, and just uh, uh, the, the kind of joy these people can share. Uh, I hope you'll come to our open house tomorrow at 5. I hope you'll come make appointments. I really hope we can give the Palo Alto community the, the, the gift it deserves. Well, thank you.